Hello again, this is Musanda Mulundu Chipampata and um, this is just a, a bonus video that I've decided to do because um, I just could not get uh, this off my mind. I just thought um, I should explain it um, and um, it's to do with basically my um, affiliation to uh, the church or Christianity and how um, bipolar has uh, played a role in that. Um, initially, uh, when I first had my relapse, I, I was in a church uh, in Austin, Texas, and they had been praying for me, holding hands and things, uh, sorry, putting hands on me and things like that. And I must have obviously triggered at that point because uh, all I remember is pushing everyone away from me and running home, you see. So initially what had happened was um, in a church, you basically sit in the queues and they started praying and they started, uh, as we we're praying with our eyes closed, obviously, uh, they started pushing me slowly but surely to uh, the front of the church. And when I got to the front of the church, they all put their laid their hands on me and things like that, and they continued to pray for me, and that freaked me out at the time because I think I might have just snapped at that point, because in my imagination or in the psychotic uh, situation I now realize I was in, and obviously in combination with uh, my Christian beliefs at the time, um, I felt like a demon had been cast in me, you see. So it was a combination of all that has been put in my mind and the state that I was in, as in my mind was in. So anyway, that was my initial relapse in um, August of uh, 99. And um, that's where it all started. I ran home. Um, nobody understood what had happened because I just wanted to sleep. I didn't want to be disturbed. I didn't want to speak to anybody. Um, I was hallucinating, I was seeing um, all kinds of things, it's like my senses had been um, alerted. Basically what happens when um, you're in psychosis is your brain functions at uh, a higher rate than it normally does. So you hear, you well, you, your senses are just haywire. So you hear things, you, you, you imagine you're seeing things. Um, you remember things um, and it's all happening at a very rapid pace. Anyway, um, this went on for a period of about a week. Uh, I'm not sure, could have been longer. My older sister kept panicking and calling uh, 911, but with the noise of the sirens, uh, of the police car, the fire uh, engine and ambulance, and in the state that I was in, uh, just made me even more paranoid and m made my imagination go even more wild. Um, so I in America, they, um, they ask you, you the patient, if you want to go uh, to the hospital or not. And if you refuse, they go back. I kept refusing. I think they might have been called three or four times before finally I gave up and I was taken in. Now this whole time I didn't sleep and I'd been hallucinating for about a week. So I had gone so far in uh, my mind that um, I couldn't distinguish between um, reality and um, what wasn't known. So anyway, pretty much what happened was I, um, I started running. In my mind, I was running in a football pitch, right? simultaneously uh, I was imagining I was my father it's weird but it's almost like somehow I kind of imagined that my dad would be celebrating victory of some sort um, but my dad died died when I was three so that makes it even more strange but anyway <clears throat> so I'm simultaneously going through parallels because now my brain is like functioning at an optimum and um, I'm acting it out. So obviously I'm running and I look insane, but in my mind there's so much that's going on. 
anyway, eventually the people at the hospital managed to tackle me, got me back, injected me, put me to sleep, and I must have slept for a while. I'm not sure how long, but it was quite long because I was sedated quite, quite dramatically. That's basically the first incidents that happened. The other incidences were different, but I'm not going to focus too much on them now. Um, I wanted to speak about, I want to fast track till 2010, when I suddenly, I was with an ex of mine, who I'm not going to mention the name because it's not relevant. Um, but then I just suddenly, it was in August of 2010, I suddenly got the urge of going back to church because I had stopped going to church after this first incident because I just felt like though you know church was evil and a demon had been cast in me and I'm not going to go back again so I kind of stopped going to church for years 2010 August uh, just after the World Cup had been here in South Africa I um, had suddenly had an urge I was living in uh, Rudaport at the time at a friend's place because I didn't have a proper place to stay at the time. And I started going to church. So I just asked to take me to any church. It doesn't matter. I think I need Jesus because like I've been raised as a Christian. And that's all I've ever known. And I come from a Christian country, Christian family. That's all we believe, just Christianity. So, you know, if you're taken out of your comfort zone, you default back to uh, religion and church and Anybody you meet who gives you advice, they always tell you to pray or to go to church and things like that. That's that's just it. We can't think beyond that. It's like our minds are just programmed to operate in that way. So obviously my life had gone through certain stages where um, it got to a point where I felt, you know what, nothing else is working. Let me, let me tr uh, give this church thing a try again. So I went to Randberger Church. I think it's called New creation christian center run by a nigerian and um, he was a pastor stroke prophet so the first sunday i attended he actually prophesied to me you know so called prophesying which i've later learned is you know mystery but um basically yeah he looked at me and he said uh, you look troubled uh, you look like you've lost everything and um, i'll give an example of this fan you know if you lose this fan god's gonna give you so much more and all that stuff so at the time you know i was very skeptical about prophets and things like that but um i was at a weak point so i thought to myself you know i'll continue coming for, for what it's worth because i do need some sort of um, motivation so i continued going to his church right and all he would talk about is money. He actually wanted me to buy him a Mercedes Benz. I wasn't driving a Mercedes Benz at the time, but I don't know how I was supposed to do it. But he said he kept dreaming of me uh, having um, sacks of money, three of three sacks of money, and I give him one, things like that. So he was just planting seeds in my mind for me to like have this, um, uh, how can I put it? Uh, he, yeah, for me to have hope, basically, that I'm going to, you know, uh, hit it big. Anyway, so whilst going to his church, there's, I was introduced by my ex again to another guy, um, a prophet. He was claiming to be Zambian, but he was actually from, uh, from the DRC. Because when he spoke English, it sounded French. He could speak Bemba, which is my language, fluently. But when he, whenever he spoke English, it was like uh, with a French accent. So I knew definitely he wasn't Zambian. And you know, this was like, I wasn't, he wasn't a pastor. He was just like a proper prophet. So anyway, I'd go to, we'd go to him Saturday evenings and um, he would prophesy to everyone, would sing a certain song and everyone, you know, people would testify because um, they believed that they had uh, received a miracle and all that stuff. And I went there, not because I even believed, but... I needed something, you know, my life needed to change. So I thought, you know, it's better than uh, what I'm going through. Obviously, it costs money because you must always uh, uh, give offering and all that stuff. So you find yourself actually paying more. The little you have, you're paying, you know, and not getting anywhere. Anyway, so he prophesied as well to me many times. Uh, there's an incident where uh, a friend of mine from Botswana came over left me with his car unfortunately the car got stolen 
So I told him about it because I believed he was a prophet. He was probably going to see because he he claimed he could see things like he's watching it on a screen on a on a on a, on a, on a uh, in a movie. So he says, "I've seen the car. I know where it is. You're going to get it. Don't worry." So I had some hope. I'm like, "Hey, I hope this guy's right." Obviously, and the car never got recovered, and uh, you know, it's been many years since. Anyway, um, I want to fast track now from 2010 till about because what happened basically is I lost hope in the prophets and in the Pentecostal uh, system which is what I was introduced to I broke up with the ex that I'm speaking about and then um, I was like on my own so there's another ex from like way back who sent me a, a link of some sermons uh, because I had been posting some things on Facebook so she could see that um, I was in some kind of pain yeah so she sent me some link of a evangelist in america called eric walsh and um it's on audio verse so i started listening to it and it turns out that it was um, sda uh, seventh day adventist so i didn't have anything going i'd stopped going to the two churches uh, and i'd moved back to zambia um so i i continued listening to the to the sermons and um I literally listened to them in from 2011 till about 2012, 13, somewhere there. And through listening to them, getting more research about uh, Seventh-day Adventists and all that stuff, I got converted into that way of thinking because it was so different from anything I knew. There was no nonsense like speaking in tongues, no nonsense like prophesying, things that I'd clearly seen that were wasting my time. So... I liked it basically and um, I started uh, taking it seriously. Um, in the period before I became SDA, I had uh, read the Bible three and a half times and uh, a lot of the scriptures were like stored in my mind. So um, I was able to fit in well with the SDAs because they're very well learned. They study very much and um, not only do they study the Bible, but they study other books by Ellen White. So I didn't understand at first what Ellen White was all about, but you know I went with it because uh, I just thought, you know, this is better than anything that I've ever been to. So my time at the SDA in my Christian life was like the best, you know, I can say that because it was simple, clean, pure, and I think, yeah, it was, it was awesome. However, when I understood uh, what Ellen White actually stood for and all that stuff, it's like I hit a stumbling block, you know, suddenly all the hope and desires that I'd ever um, wanted and everything just came to a halt. I was very disappointed and it kind of pushed me into uh, a semi-depression. So I thought to myself, well, I still have knowledge of the Bible, so it's not too bad. So I quit going to the SDA, even though they had baptized me and you know, we spent a lot of time with a lot of them. I still have a lot of friends uh, from the SDA realm and things like that um, but yeah I, I couldn't accept the whole LNG white concept because she's a prophetess apparently and uh, she's got some inspiration from the Bible <clears throat> with this parts where they say she went to heaven and she had a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus she saw Jesus moving from one part of heaven to the other you know that was just too too ridiculous for me to follow anymore so I, I had to can it you know I'm, I'm that kind of person Anyway, so fast tracking again, because this I want to focus now just on the religious side to about 2013. I had gone into the DRC for six months with uh, an Egyptian uh, colleague of mine, and we had gone there on some business, stayed there for six months. And then um, there's the Nigerian guy had told me that, you know, for you to like really be uh, a solid Christian, you have to fast dry fast for three days uh, no water nothing three continuous days 24 hours like uh, 72 hours sorry so i did it i did it there's an argument i had with the egyptian guy he was arguing over food and that was ridiculous for me so i got upset and i thought i'm just gonna fast for three days i'm not gonna eat anything i'm gonna do what the nigerian guy asked me to do so i did it three days i almost uh, passed out but uh, I achieved it and for me I felt like I had done something great you know 
just like when I was being baptized by the SDAs, I felt like that was the best day of my life. I thought like, you know, now Jesus is definitely going to come like tomorrow. But yeah, those are like the two um, spiritual sides. However, the whole point of this video was for me to focus on um, this element of my uh, religion and the way it affects uh, bipolar. Basically, what happens is this. When uh, I was in and out of psychosis, so the time I was in the, when, I think it's after I left the SDA realm, I started focusing now on the Bible alone because now I was thinking to myself, I don't have a church or affiliation, but I'm still a Christian. So I'll just read the Bible continuously and evangelize as much as I can, convert as many people as possible and just do God's work and be a steward. So what would happen is because I was now in a semi-depression, I'd go in and out of psychosis. So when I'd go into psychosis, because I'd read the Bible so much, I knew so many of the verses, it would be easy for me to recite them. Now, the way my brain was working in psychosis would be, I'd be able to pick something from my own life, from my past, synchronize it with whatever scripture I'm thinking about at the time. If I'm chatting to somebody or trying to convince someone to be a Christian, synchronize their situation with the event and make sense of the whole thing because my brain is in a state of psychosis everything is synchronized and it's making so much sense so i went on a rampage and uh, i did a lot of posting on facebook uh, a lot you know i think too much and this went on for a while um it started off with what I seemed would be like my testimony because um, I yeah I had to explain how the whole religious thing had affected me and how in the end um, I got bipolar you know like uh, you know from from Austin however so what happened to me then was uh, I went on a rampage went on a rampage and I ended up um, relapsing after a series of these events like now I went into a serious relapse because i'd go into psychosis temporarily then i'd assume that it's the holy spirit because in my christian thinking i was thinking the state that i was in had to be the holy spirit because how was i getting this insight how was i able to remember the scriptures remember parts of my life related to people that i was talking to and then put it all in a scripture most of the people thought I was becoming a pastor or things like that and I was getting a lot of attention on Facebook which I really did not like it irritated me so I started removing a lot of people off my uh, Facebook I had like 500 friends I reduced them to like 150 because I didn't like the attention I was suddenly getting because that wasn't I didn't feel that was the point anyway in 2014 I came or came back to South Africa and I'd continued the spate of posts on Facebook and um, getting in and out of um, psychosis until something insane happened where uh, I was at my brother's place and I saw some uh, like little monster like thing uh, appear through the glass so I punched through the glass and I cut myself but there wasn't anything there that was all in my mind because I was in and out of psychosis so he obviously rushed me to the hospital. He, he was sleeping at the time. This was like in two, 2 in the morning. And I'd gone about a week without sleep again. So that's, the, that's like my official relapse after like a 13-year uh, spate. Anyway, I was rushed to the hospital and um, obviously put on meds and things like that. And... I just basically wanted to explain that that aspect of how religion has uh, affected me. Um, I think a person with bipolar has got a very creative imagination. It's really unfair for them to be um, explained the things that are in in the Bible because we visualize everything, and when our when we're in psychosis. All that stuff becomes real because a part of my experience is uh, when I'm in hectic psychosis 
because of um, the religious um, influence, you feel like you're, you're a savior, you know? This is where I can relate to Sean uh, Blackwell, you see? Sean Blackwell explains this very well as well, you know? Like he's done some hectic research on this. Obviously, he's gathered information from all kinds of um, bipolar uh, patients and things like that. We do experience that, especially if we have a religious background, but it's not, it's not something good. You know, it's, it's, it's something quite scary. But, you know, I wonder to myself that some of the people who are out there doing things like preaching and things like that, how do we know what state they're in? Because if your brain is working at a certain uh, pace, you'll be able to uh, express yourself in a way that uh, the next person won't be able to because you're in a state that they're not in. You know, they say it's a chemical imbalance, but yeah, the the aspects of it, I suppose, that are positive and that can be um, used to to an advantage in a way. You know, like in my case, people thought I was really uh, serious, which I was uh, about my religious beliefs in Christianity and things like that. But it led me, um, because of the disappointment of the SDA um, church. I just gave up everything to do with uh, religion, but I did try to continue, uh, but it still took me into hectic uh, psychosis. So I have di I've actually had to um, let go of religion completely because of my imagination. Um, even if you put anything in my mind and I go into psychosis, I can believe I'm the greatest anything. You know, like I said, Sean Blackwell has explained this element of it, and I can relate 100% with uh, his research because I experience it. So I don't want to drag. This has been an extremely long video. So I just want to say thank you for your time. And yeah, this was like really burning me in my chest. I needed to get it out. Well, like part of my healing is actually speaking about it. Sharing it is just to help those people that are experiencing the same thing that are not able to talk about it so you know we are all part of the same uh, world so I don't see why uh, we can't share some of these things there's a lot of people that are like you know in the closet about this situation but for me now I I don't mind so much thank you